parents consider themselves Europeans and not Jewish at all. So, so I came in, a, in the world broke out in the region, and suddenly we were Jews. And suddenly we were pressed into a ghetto. We were sent to a concentration camp through whom my mother was killed before. And um, so I suddenly was alone. It was in 41, it was very true. My mother was killed, I was separated from my father. I was alone, I was eight and a half years old. I was the only one son in my family, a very precious son. And suddenly I'm alone in a uh, concentration camp. We are around me. And I understood I will remain another day, two days, I will die. So I escaped. Where to go? Where to work, what, what will happen to me? So this is, you see, a mark, this is reality. Reality has reality. And I spent, um, after looking for all kinds of people, maybe I'll find some war, maybe someone to give me a piece of bread, a cup of tea. And, um, <clears throat> and suddenly I see a small house. And I knocked on the door. A young woman, a beautiful woman, opened the door. It was like, it was like in a dream, like in a legend. Someone's opening your door and asking me what I want to do, or what I'm going to do. So, uh, so I said to her, I want to work. Do you have for me a war? She said to me, yes, come on. I was with this woman, I was quite, quite a long time. I was working to clean, to clean the house, to go to the village, buy products for her. And it was, you know, like in a dream. Yesterday I was at home with my parents, with my grandparents. Here I am alone. Something is a, it is a, a misunderstanding. It is a nightmare. What I'm going to do? So it, I was working. At the night, at the night, peasant used to come to her, to speak, to kiss, to hug. And uh, you know, I'm coming from a petite bourgeois family, you know, nothing naked was in my family. And suddenly, all, all around, I was naked. <laughs> <laughs> this was, you know, my first, I finished at home my first grade. This was my second grade. <laughs> and the good, I, I was afraid, you know, she was a tall woman, beautiful woman, and her clients were very, very huge peasants. In I was afraid, just afraid. See, what are they going to do to me? But there were nights, there were winter nights that were quiet. <coughs> and we were sitting in drinking soup, the hot soup. And she will tell me about her life, what happened. 
happened to her where she was born in a town near Kishina. And suddenly she said to me, you know, I was born in a town and not in a village. My clients in the town were Jewish students. They know how to appreciate the woman, not like these horses who are coming to me. They are bringing me chocolates. They are bringing me all good things. So, so I was tempted to say to her, I am Jewish too. But I knew <laughs> that this is a secret. I could not say it. No one should know that I am Jewish. So I was with her for a couple of months. And this was my first experience outside my home. One day, came up to me a person and said, looked at me and said to me, boy, what are you doing here? So I tell him, you are Jewish. So I was sure, so this is them. He's going to kill me. Oh, I don't know what. I don't know who put in my head to say to him, how do you dare, how do you dare to say to a Christian boy that he is Jewish? <laughs> Surprised him. <laughs> Surprised him. And I, but I understood that, that and after such an observation, I am in a danger. If one, someone found that I'm Jewish, I was blonde, blue eyes, you know, you can see it now. <laughs> um, so, but, but what's important here in coming to your question, you know, fiction and reality, and I've become to learn but when I was with, with her about the body, strange thing. People have a body, everyone has a body. How does this body function? And uh, this was for me because it was not a sexual, only a sexual matter. And I was a child, eight and a half, nine years old. It was a curiosity of the naked bodies. And this is something that that gave me a sign later on, when I became 20, 25, 26. It gave me an indication what art is. Art is sensuality. It's not an abstract thinking. It is sensuality. Painting is sensuality. Music is sensuality. Uh, you cannot approach a literary work with ideas. Yes, there are some ideas too, but the, sen the, the essential thing is the sensuality. In there, not by my parents, this was my first lesson, now a real lesson. And it was very interesting, and uh, it was not an abstract matter. Every evening, we had a big, such a pile, you know. She, she, after her work, she was washing, and I helped her to wash her. So it's another, you know, so we had a conversation about body, and she was somewhere religious. And so we spoke about the body, you know, the soul, you know. And he said that this, the body is actually the soul. This is the soul. It's always something you, can, you cannot see. Mm. So you see, it is I was with her, a lonely creature. But all the time she learned me something. I get from her less indirectly. 
I could not bless them what you do. Then I have seen that some peasants are looking at me. So I understood that I am in a danger. So I left her by not saying a word. And then I was uh, I was adopted by criminals. What kind of criminals? Because outside the village, in every Ukrainian village, outside the village, they were living the prostitutes, the riches, the horse dealers, <clears throat> the insane people, all kind of crazy people. So I was with them. This was so here was my great three horses, thieves, animals, dogs. They became my friends. I could not speak with the criminals. I spoke quite well Ukrainian, but uh, it's an accent. So I was mute all the time, not speaking. And, um, and uh, I, we were, there were thieves actually, horse And I was with them, and I've learned how to steal, how to be a thief. And I was with them for a couple of, five months, four months, five months, maybe more. They were tough people. In the evening, sometimes one of them will sing songs, you know, sad songs. Then I understood, probably not fully, that melody is something important in life. You can be a thief, you can be a criminal, but you are still the nights you are singing sad songs and drink the vodka and sing sex or you know to yourself. I understood the melody, something important to me. True, I used to say to myself, I used to say to myself sometimes, why I am here? Why am I here among the seas? Why I'm not going to school? All the children in the morning are going to school. What is wrong with me? Maybe I, I have a bad smell. Something maybe is wrong with me. In some you know, general thief criminal they do not ask. Peasants are asking questions. Criminals don't ask questions. So I have, I have learned that you can be a criminal, but you have still a soul in your body. You, there was one of the criminals that used, he had a shoe, a woman shoe. And once a week, twice a week, he would take out the shoe from his and kiss it. Kiss the shoe. He would kiss the shoe. <clears throat> and this was from the American range, you know. Again, this kind of thing. Probably it's a shoe for a woman, but you know, And uh, So, I've seen a lot. When I came out of the, from the woods in '44, I was liberated by the Russian army. I was still a child, but a very grown-up people. I was a child, but mute, not speaking for years, not using the language. I became, you know, a mute, a mute creature. From the other side, I felt 
that I have accumulated and not in my young life, what I'm going to do with it, how to express it, how to give to it form, what kind of form I'm going to use, what language I'm going to use. So, it's life, and I, I form it later into fiction. What is reality and what is fiction? Reality is what we see, what we have. Fiction is you transform your experience. You, you have a new form. Because what happened to you, you cannot copy it. Copying is history, memoir, and so on. You have to form it. Somehow also to the body belongs also uh, the dreams. Yes. It is something very, very important. I mean, for example, in your novel, The Man Who Never Stopped Sleeping, Le Garçon Qui Voulait Dormir, uh, there's always two levels. On one hand, you have what he's going through in, let's say, reality, when he's not sleeping. And on the other hand, you have, and at least as important as what is happening awake, is what is happening to him in his dreams. When, when he sees the parents, he can be talking again to people that disappear. He can, he's far from home. He arrived already in Israel, but he can go back to his home. You were saying you had to reconstruct your life. But to reconstruct, you need imagination, memory, and feelings. Could you explain us how this works for you, this process of concrete memories? You see, I have lost my parents, my grandparents, actually my total family. I was alone. And how much can a man know? An orphan, a permanent man. A permanent orphan. So the question was how to regain it, how to regain life, how to bring back to life my parents, my family. The street where I was born, this is, uh, the Bronx is so through writing and through imagining or reimagining. You reconstruct. It was a long process, and I'm still doing it. It's the longest process for reconstructing you know, the, my life. But actually, it's not my life. It is a reconstructed life. No. And you know, a child uh, has, a, has, a memo, has a memory, but maybe has an imagination. So, it is to take pieces, pieces from my life, small memories. The hand of my mother taking me to the kindergarten. It's something that repeats itself. But another thing is also um, remembering is always going with feeling sensation, imagination, as we call it. it, it it's not alone. The memory is not, it's not stable. It changes. You see something when you are 20 or 20 years old, you have a memory, some shades of what you have seen before. But then you are 40 years old, it's different. And then you are 60, it's more. So memory is a dynamic matter. And you have to follow it. You understand you have to follow it. Because when I say memory, it's not something that has a full form that will stay forever. No. It changes all the time. Mm -hmm. Corresponding to the distance you get yes. 
it's a different balance between imagination and really concrete memory. Yes, of course. Yeah. And, then, and then, in a moment, you are totally in the hands of your imagination. We mm -hmm. think imagination is not something <coughs> false, it's not something imaginary. It is imagination is very concrete. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have been talking already about your experience yeah. when you were escaping from the camp and you were arriving in the forest. You've been talking about the forest, but I, I remember uh, that you said uh, when arriving in the forest, when you saw the tree, that yeah. sometimes you feel a gap in your body. You see, I was a child, and even it was a very cruel life, I still was a child. I still was a child of that, so I, I used to sit and see a stream of water, look at the stream of water, and see my face, water, and be amazed. In the woods there are a lot of birds, mm -hmm. and I would follow the birds. But my best friend, as I mentioned before, there were the animals, with people I could not speak. There were not people who I could speak, not the clients, of Victoria and not, uh, and not the criminals. And, but the animals were very kind to me. The horses, the dogs. Mm -hmm. They were very, very kind to me. Thank you. Uh, have you feel that it's the right moment for them to be writing about? See, everyone has moments in his life that he cannot speak about them. It can be shame, it can be a horror, it can be all kind of, you cannot speak about them. They are too harsh, they are too heavy to speak about them. So you are getting silence. In this moment particularly, uh, I left, the, I was separated from my father when I was somewhere eight and a half years old. And then I met him later, when I was 25 years old, I finished university. <clears throat> so, it was a shock. It was not, I cannot, it was a joy, of course, to find your father, but then, you were not with him for 15 years. You have changed, he has changed, you know. Um, so it is something you cannot speak about it. And actually, you can say the most crucial moments in your life, the essential moment, you cannot speak about. You cannot speak not only because you do not have words for it. It's also, it's a something of the holy. You, can, you cannot touch it. Yes. So, uh, true, everyone has such moments. And they will be with you. Sometimes they will, they will be, this kind of moments will be with you forever. You will never speak about them. But sometimes you find in them a you find a meaning. You find meaning in them. And they became very lovely and treasurous in the element of creation. Yes. So uh, but here it's very important to say we think literature are words. You are explaining, you are telling, you are interpreting, you are showing. All this is important. But most important, the most important thing is to keep silence. And silence the real words exist. There, the silence is something 
that gives you a different perspective. Because sometimes you have a feeling that literature is a mass of words that, that want to cover you. No, it's many explanations, psychological, sociological, political explanation. You are covered with words. You cannot utter a word. Everything is explained, is analyzed. So you wish the moment of silence when you are really with yourself. So how do you bring this silence into, if I may say so, into words? This is into words. But it's very important, uh, the Bible, the Hebrew Bible is a very good example. Hebrew prose is very, generally when we speak about Bible, we speak about God and morals. But prose is prose. And uh, in the biblical prose is very factual. Very spare in words. Very much spare. If you can say something in one word, it's wonderful. If you can say it in two words, it's a weakness. <laughs> it's very, very spare, very, very spare. Factual, just facts, just good facts. How to understand the human being? Give us the two facts. <coughs> Another thing, it's in the Bible, you do not have an external we do not know was Abraham tall, was, was he small, was he old, had he glasses, nothing. But we know his, his deeds, his actions. And this is a very, then it's another very spare element. And the most important thing is, most of the characters in the Bible, Sinners, heavy sinners. There is no saint in this Bible. So the Bible was for me a very, very good teacher. I'm not a religious. I do not come from a religious home. But the Bible was a teacher in literature. And how to write. And how not to write. What to say, what not to say, the most important thing. So, silence is a kind of, when you are not saying, when you are not over saying, then there is a silence. I, I would like that, we are writing already at our last part. I would like to, to talk a little bit about motivations for writing and, and about the question of whom you're writing for. Um, c'est ce que j'appelais avant raconter Sertuis, mais pour qui et pourquoi J'aimerais commencer ici encore une fois avec le garçon qui voulait dormir. Euh, tout le roman peut se lire en fait à un second degré, comme une longue parabole. Et nous retrouvons peut-être un peu Kafka, maître de, de la parabole. Dans le garçon qui voulait dormir, euh, on peut lire en effet l'histoire d'un homme qui se réfugie d'abord dans le sommeil, puis, une fois blessé au combat et incapable de marcher, il doit subir maintes opérations de ses jambes, au total en fait huit opérations, afin d'en prendre à marcher à nouveau et de se mettre au terme de son rétablissement à, à marcher à nouveau, mais aussi à écrire. Et le personnage a beau s'enfuir dans son monde intérieur tout le temps, du moins régulièrement, il n'en reste pas moins que ceux autour qu'il appelle, les autres réfugiés qu'il appelle affectueusement le garçon du sommeil, attendent quelque chose de lui. Je cite. Un réfugié m'accosta un jour, intrigué. C'est bien toi, le garçon du sommeil Oui, à ma connaissance. Sache que nous t'avons porté tout au long de la route. Tu n'étais pas bien lourd, mais tu étais quand même une charge pour nous. C'était très irritant. 
Tu n'avais pas l'air d'avoir été battu ou souffrir, mais tu t'approchais au sommeil avec une force phénoménale. Parmi nous, il y avait ceux qui pensaient qu'il ne fallait pas te laisser dormir, que ce sommeil pouvait être mortel. Et ils faisaient tout pour te réveiller. Mais le sommeil était coulé en toi comme du bronze, et même les chaos de la route ne t'en détournaient pas. Au fond de nous, nous placions en toi de grands espoirs, si je peux me permettre de parler au pluriel. Nous pensions, bientôt le garçon va se réveiller et il nous racontera des choses que nous ne savons pas. Et voici que tu es réveillé. Grâce à qui et où à quoi Je n'en ai pas la moindre idée. Mais tout de même, as-tu vu dans ton sommeil Je l'ignore encore. Quand nous sauras-tu En temps voulu il me semble personnellement que l'écriture a pu faire le gain. Donc, ce qu'on attend de lui comme de ce garçon du sommeil a une triple fonction. D'abord, il s'agit, je pense, de sauver de l'oubli, puis de témoigner, et enfin, peut-être paradoxalement, de délivrer un message profondément humaniste, au sens le plus noble du terme. First sentence, two sentences, they have a melody that you can write a book with motif, light motifs, and so on. You do not have the melody, you cannot write. So, proceed and book something one day in a melody. It came a melody, it reminds me as a child. You are. was astonished. Was amazed. Was this? Oh, comes a shield. It's not something of a speculation of thinking and so on. You don't think you think is bad. Forget about it. 